Lovely. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming to this talk about building Monzo's base. Um, yeah, let's get started. So at Monzo, we have uh, over 1,000 distributed uh, microservices in production, and each of these are small and context-bound to a specific function. This allows us to be flexible in uh, scaling our, our services um, as demand grows, but also scaling services across teams as the number of engineers grows at Monzo. Now, the predominant, uh, program language, uh, the predominant programming language at Monzo is Go. Um, Go is a fantastic language uh, because it has support for you know, great uh, uh, network communication libraries, um, as well as uh, great programming primitives. It's statically typed, um, which is really good uh, when it comes to validation and make sure that your code is correct before it goes into production. But some teams prefer to use uh, other languages. Um, a good example is the, uh, the data team. Uh, they like to use Python because uh, they have a lot of machine learning libraries and, and infrastructure uh, from the open source community, uh, which makes it really easy for them uh, to, to get up and running. We don't want these languages to feel like second class citizens on our platform. Now, even though Go has a great use case, um, our platform needs to be polyglot and language agnostic. We want to support the same service characteristics um, uh, for every single program language used at Go, uh, used at Monzo, sorry. Um, bit of an introduction. Uh, my name is Sahel. Um, I work on the infrastructure and reliability squad here at Monzo. Um, our role is to build Monzo's base layer uh, to make sure that it's uh, up, running, secure, and reliable. So engineers don't have to worry about those sorts of things. They can focus on building uh, Monzo, uh, making Monzo the best bank product in the world. Um, we build the foundation so engineers can ship their services um, without having to worry about uh, if their servers are up or if uh, the, the databases are provisioned or if there's capacity in the cluster. Now, in a nutshell, uh, this is what Monzo's platform looks like. Uh, we've got physical data centers uh, relaying for, for payment-related information, uh, but the majority of our platform lives on top of Amazon Web Services, AWS. Um, there was a whole suite of open source components uh, that we use, such as Kubernetes, Cassandra, Kafka, NSQ, Vault, Prometheus. Um, all of these components underpin our platform. And then we add our, our secret source, which is our, our distributed microservices on top, and that's what makes Monzo. Services leverage these uh, platform open source offerings and uh, sit alongside these components on our platform. Now, there's a few things that we request uh, for, for services on our platform uh, that we request from engineers. Firstly, we want them to be self-contained. Um, what I mean by that is uh, we want them to have everything that they need to get up and running on our platform without having to go to the internet to pull dependencies or need manual handcrafting of, uh, of uh, specific uh, dependency management and stuff like that. So we don't want you to uh, go to the internet and uh, pull random stuff down from, from uh, third-party sources. We want them to be uh, audited and verifiable uh, before we actually ship them to production. We want services to be scalable. Um, what that means is that on our platform, if we give you more resources, if we give you more cl cluster capacity, or we add more copies of your application running concurrently, it means we want you to be able to do more work. Um, we, want, uh, we also run multiple copies of all of our applications to allow for higher availability. Services should be stateless. Um, a replica of a service shouldn't need to know about the presence or state of other replicas. Um, and there's little affinity. So you know, you're not stuck to one particular node or, or a specific set of infrastructure. If a particular copy of an application goes away, another one can pick off exactly where the previous one left off. Lastly, um, we want uh, authors of uh, services uh, to know that faults can happen. We provide frameworks and guidance uh, from the platform team uh, on what kind of failure modes to expect. It should be completely routine that your application might restart in the middle of a, of a process that you are doing within your application. Now, to ship and uh, run these microservices, uh, we leverage containers and Kubernetes. All services uh, shipped on top of our Kubernetes cluster run on uh, our, our Amazon Web Services um, set of servers. Um, and services have multiple replicas and po or, or, or pods in uh, Kubernetes parlance uh, to allow for high availability and scaling as our requirements grow. Now, with services having these properties, it helps a lot in the case of uh, when, when nodes fail. When nodes fail, uh, you know, that's a pretty routine thing to happen in a, in a, in a large set of infrastructure uh, that runs on Amazon. That shouldn't be a, a, a page-worthy event. If this happens at 3 in the morning, as long as there's no impact to customers, no engineer should need to wake up. 
Um, and we want uh, authors of services to design their, their, their services so that they can tolerate this sort of failure. We undertake exercises routinely where we move all copies of applications running in production to completely different nodes live while they're serving requests um, to make sure that uh, there are no specific singleton services um, which, are, which are not tolerant of this kind of failure to make them less fragile. Now, to deploy things onto a system like Kubernetes, you often declare what you want the system to do, um, and it will figure it out. Um, to achieve this, uh, engineers need to write hundreds of lines of YAML or JSON, uh, which they would typically provide to Kubernetes. Sorry about the feedback. <laughs> um, engineers uh, at Monzo don't need to interface with Kubernetes YAML uh, to run their code. No engineer wants to write hundreds of lines of YAML uh, to get their service shipped every single time. Engineers can tell our platform uh, that their code is reviewed and on the main line, um, and we've built a ton of tooling. Um, we have a dedicated squad called Engineering Effectiveness who've built dedicated tooling um, which can get these changes rolled out to production safely um, while serving uh, user requests. Um, this allows engineers uh, to deploy hundreds of times a day to production daily. Um, these tools, they do uh, static checks and security checks um, to make sure that the code is ready to go. Now, services at Monzo are context-bound and serve a specific role. This means very often um, one service will need data related to uh, an, uh, another domain to piece things together. For example, a single request from your Monzo app uh, may hit 20 or plus microservices uh, downstream in our platform. Now, we build APIs and interfaces uh, between these services. We design the, uh, our services uh, so that they're context-bound, so they don't have leaky abstractions. Each service is responsible for a particular set of data, um, and we share by communicating. You don't want multiple copies of the, of the same bits of data scattered all throughout your, uh, your different sets of applications, because it means that we need to build, um, we would have to build multiple um, uh, systems uh, to keep all of that reconciled and up to date, which is a big pain. Now, in an environment where services are moving around often and things are never where you left them, um, you know, how do services find and communicate with each other? Say you're the transaction service and you want to talk to the account service. How do you find where that data lives and uh, where that service lives and send it a request for some data? Um, here's where the service mesh comes into play. Each of our nodes um, has a, 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 each of our services have a, have a service mesh um, attached to it. Um, and you know, they, they know where all the other services live. Um, it means that services don't need to have uh, a bunch of logic around uh, retries and timeouts and, and stuff like that. Um, all of that is built into the service mesh. So for example, we use a service mesh called Envoy, um, uh, which is super powerful. We've written a full blog post about it if you're more interested in the technical. Um, but the service mesh handles everything it needs um, to proxy the request, in this example, to service.account. So yeah, the service mesh is responsible for uh, what we call service discovery, to find other services running on our platform, um, where they are, where they live, what port they're listening on, um, and handles key things like timeouts and deadlines and uh, failures uh, when, when things go wrong. Um, if services want to communicate on our platform, all they need to do is speak HTTP and JSON. Um, this means that no matter what language you use, uh, you can get up and running on our platform without a ton of uh, libraries or tooling because the majority of langu uh, programming languages have great support for HTTP and JSON. Now, we've talked a, a lot about uh, direct communication from service to service, um, but a lot of communication happens asynchronously in the background. For example, you'd publish an event and other services that are interested in such an event will pick it up. Um, this is what we call asynchronous messaging. Uh, um, now, for asynchronous messaging, we provide systems like NSQ and Kafka, um, which are very high throughput message queues. Um, last I checked on NSQ, we're publishing, uh, we're processing more, uh, a couple billion messages every single day. That's a lot of events. Now, just because it's asynchronous, it doesn't mean it needs to be slow. For example, when you use your card, uh, this notification uh, is generated and sent to your phone, usually before the receipt even comes out on the till. Um, other coffee shops are available. Um, yeah. Now, whilst all our services themselves are stateless, ultimately services do need to store their data somewhere. Uh, we need to store all your information about like, who you are and what your balance is and uh, everything like that. And to do that, we provide a highly available Cassandra cluster. 
Um, Cassandra is a distributed and highly available fault-tolerant database, um, and we provide that as a service um, to all engineers at Monza that they can use, but they don't have to worry about. It's something that we manage. It's uh, scalable and resilient thanks to its quorum-based model, which means that if it loses, a, a, if a Cassandra cluster loses a particular node, it can continue to serve requests uh, with no problem at all. Now, in a distributed system, you need a way to do exclusive operations. Uh, so we leverage a, a system called etcd, um, which has great locking primitives to do distributed locking and allow for exclusive operations. This means that you can't like, do things like uh, decrement uh, two services fighting to decrement the balance or something like that. Now, finally, we have Prometheus. This is our all-seeing eye into our platform. So at each of our services, uh, they expose metrics at a particular endpoint. And Prometheus hoovers up all of that data um, and puts it into a, a really nice extensible querying language. So services that are built on top of our Go libraries, for example, um, use our internal libraries that we've built within the platform team um, to get a bunch of metrics around uh, throughput and uh, like you know, the number of requests that it's serving and Cassandra queries and stuff like that, all for free without having to write a single line of metrics code. Now, combining all of that uh, with uh, Grafana, um, which is a, a dashboarding system that you see on the screen, uh, you can provide insight into what each of our services is really doing. This is how we've been able to scale to more than 1,000 microservices while having the visibility and insight into what every single service is doing. By having these consistent metrics and labeling across all of our services, we can see every single service from a single pane of glass. Now, monitoring is not just at an infrastructure level. We want to provide this as a service um, to all engineers across Monzo so that they can plot their business level metrics as well. Uh, for example, this is a dashboard of uh, how we uh, monitor faster payments that are occurring throughout our system throughout the day at Monzo. So that's a brief overview of our platform. Uh, now, how did we leverage all of this uh, to run uh, the crowdfunding campaign so that all of you could uh, be here today? So there are four key requirements that we needed to tackle uh, before we could go ahead with crowdfunding. Um, we needed to, the first two were requirements on our applications. We couldn't raise more than 20 million pounds um, because that's what we'd agreed with our board and um, institutional investors, um, and that was a hard deadline. Um, and we needed to make sure that users had the money that they were pledging beforehand so that, uh, you know, if, so that other users wouldn't miss out. Um, and you know, for the other two requirements, uh, number three and number four, handling lots of traffic and not bringing down the back, these were uh, restrictions uh, that were placed on the platform. We had to make sure that we were ready for the, the flood of people we expected to come in on the day. Now, I want to focus on the last two. Um, during the time, we did explore setting up separate infrastructure um, to run the crowdfunding campaign. But to provide the best experience to users and also to our engineers, um, we eventually decided to use the exact same platform that runs our bank because there was a lot of interdependencies with the services that were used for, for running the bank. Um, for example, we needed to make sure that you had a valid account, uh, where you were a resident of, if you had a right balance. And all of these are things that are run as part of running the bank. So that means we needed to figure out how to scale our platform. We needed to do some load testing and benchmarking to make sure that we were going to be ready on the day. So naturally, we went in search of something that we could grab off the shelf to do this sort of load testing. And there's some great systems out there. Um, my favorite is a tool called uh, Bees with Machine Guns. This is a, a, a real tool um, that you can go, and it will scale up a bunch of infrastructure and really like attack your, your, the, the service that you point it at. Um, so it does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, now, imagine sending a request to your platform team. Uh, I want to run Bees with Machine Guns on our platform. Uh, I'm sure they will have a field day. <laughs> um, but none of these tools uh, that we explored really integrated with our monitoring system. So we wanted the two to go hand in hand. Um, so we decided to build our own. So what we did is uh, you know, we, we tore apart the iOS and Android apps and uh, had a look, uh, a peek, at what exact requests they were sending under the hood to our platform. Um, and then what we did is we built a small, uh, tightly scoped service uh, running on our platform uh, written in Go, um, which would replicate this sort of behavior that our iOS and Android apps were doing um, across lots and lots of uh, users in production. Now, to control and invoke it, uh, we wrote a small wrapper script, and we called it Bingo. Um, so Bingo is our office dog, and here he is after a hard day of load testing cardboard boxes. So it seemed apt that we, uh, 
we would uh, base a load testing tool based on Bingo. So yeah, one key motivation uh, was that um, of writing our, uh, another, sorry, one key motivation of uh, writing our own load testing tool um, was that it would be able to gain read-only access to, to real user data in production um, without leaving the, the context of our platform for security. Um, this data never ever left our infrastructure. It was purely running within our infrastructure, just like every other service would, um, but it would still allow us to fulfill the needs that we needed for load testing. Now, we wanted to make sure that we could handle the load so that if every Monzo user opened their app and wanted to invest, they could do so. So we used this process to iteratively uh, figure out what services were, were under, the, under the scope of, uh, uh, like, do, when you open the app. Uh, to make sure that those services are, are scaled up. Not every service at Monza uh, is, uh, is part of the hot part when you open the app or when you use your card. There's a lot of auxil auxiliary services at Monza. Um, and we want to make sure that we find the right subset of services and scale those up and focus on them, making them more performant and faster and more optimized. So even when we were under load, we wanted to make sure that the app was going to be performant. So we, uh, by integrating with Prometheus, we could put these dashboards side by side with our service uh, level metrics and figure out what bits were suffering. Um, we could use those to inform our decisions on what bits we were going to optimize. Uh, beforehand, uh, before running the, the crowdfunding event, um, we spent a lot of time thinking about the failure scenarios. You know, if something went wrong, how would we shed load on our platform? Uh, we want to think of these scenarios beforehand and assign responsibilities and owners. Uh, we wrote, uh, we class these as runbooks, and these were to augment our uh, existing runbooks uh, to make sure that uh, you know every operational process has an owner. It's something that we thought of and practiced beforehand. It, it's so that we could back out if uh, you know things went really south. We built specialized dashboards and monitoring to get all of the visibility of the of the services in the hot path. Um, in a single pane of glass. You know, we broadcasted this on TVs, um, you know, during, during the, the crowdfunding event, we had our own room. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we could get a, a single pane of glass um, it, with very high frequency metrics uh, and monitoring into our systems. So we were able to respond to any issues that came up. Now, we weren't just monitoring for platform level metrics such as uh, latency and throughput. We're also monitoring key business metrics um, because it's all good, well and good monitoring uh, latency and throughput concerns, but it doesn't really help if no one is investing. Um, so we wanted to make sure that people were able to get through the investment flow um, and whether it was working correctly or you know, whether people were having issues. And in the end, uh, things went well. Uh, we saw 6.8 million pounds raised within the first five minutes and all, it was all over in uh, two hours and 45 minutes. So a massive uh, round of applause for all you lot. Thank you. Uh, lastly, uh, Monzo is hiring. Uh, Monzo is hiring for all sorts of engineers. I work on the platform team, and we are especially looking for platform engineers and also engineers in security. So if you're interested, uh, please come to me. I believe we have a break next. Um, and yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, my Twitter and my email is on the screen, um, and I'll also be around um, to answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs>